So we're in a big city of Denver, Colorado. It's a suburb of Denver? Mm hmm. We're in Aurora, Colorado, investigating the 12 year old cold case of Carolyn Jansen. Sometime in 2002, Carolyn disappeared. She had children looking for her, putting yes. out posters and flyers trying to find her. Three years later, an acquaintance of hers called 911, claiming that he found her decomposing body in a box in his backyard. A box that he said he was storing for a friend. It appears to be a human body. Who would think that a body could sit in a Rubbermaid container made out of plastic for three years in a patio and nobody noticed? We know where her body's found, and the man who says he found her body is one of our main suspects, but we have no idea where she was killed, how she was killed, or why she was killed. There were a few reasons that this case went cold. First of all, Carolyn was a drifter and had lost contact with her family and friends. So that made uncovering details of her life and death very difficult. Worse than that was the disagreement over her cause of death. So nobody could come to an agreement and therefore you couldn't go forward with the case. Yeah. Okay. This case will be different for us because Aurora is a pretty good sized city with its own cold case units, labs, protocols. So we've sent all the evidence off to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. We're really hoping that maybe we'll get some DNA that belongs to our killer. The container was sealed with tape. Whoever sealed that container had to have known she was in it. Carolyn's children have been looking for answers for over a decade. We're going to do our very best to try and answer those questions and solve this case. It has been 16 years and still no answers. The police consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. Look how cute. You don't see that in Vegas. I bet you're Steve. Welcome. I'm Kelly. Nice to Hi. meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Hi, Yolanda. Nice, nice you to too. meet you. Uh, I'm very excited about being able to re-examine or investigate the case because I think it's been long overdue. Hopefully we are able to push it over the edge to reach a successful prosecution. Oh, hey. How's everybody? Hi. I'm Al Brown. Alan, Steve Connor. Alan Brown is going to be helping us out on this case because he's used to working in big cities and tracking down witnesses. Start from the beginning and tell us how it all started. This case started in 2005. An individual who was moving stuff off his back porch into his garage started noticing an aroma coming from the container. He opened it up and found the remains of Carolyn Jansen. All right, emergency 911. I was just moving some stuff in one of the boxes, really. It appears to be a human body. The box that Carolyn was found in was a 33-gallon container sealed with duct tape. She was nude, wrapped in a comforter, and had been decomposing for over three years. Examinations revealed blunt force trauma with unknown origin. Carolyn had a three-inch gash above her left eye. Yeah, they said it was a fracture, right. a linear fracture. went from where the eyebrow would have been to the... Right, straight up. Right. And they did state it would be enough to cause death. Correct. How'd you identify her? She had a class ring on her finger that belonged to one of her children. And one of our detectives tracked the class ring to the individual who actually owned it. So back when Carolyn went missing, what was the story of her life at that time? She was living with a gentleman by the name of John Harrington. They both worked at the Waffle House in East Colfax. According to John, they were not intimate. It was just an arrangement to where they could both share the same apartment. And then one day, she just disappeared. So our first suspect is John J.D. Harrington? Correct. And his nickname is J.D. Roommate? Roommate. That's obviously a recent photo, I'm assuming. December of last year. Do you think it's unusual that he's saying they weren't intimate? I do. Were they lovers, question mark? Yeah. Yeah. Drugs, crack, and powder cocaine. There, there are witnesses that said that he would sell as well as use. He says she stole his money. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's his motive. J.D. was evicted from the apartment he was sharing with Carolyn around the time she went missing because he didn't pay his rent. He claimed that Carolyn had stolen his money and skipped town, which forced him to have to move himself and his belongings into his friend Richard's house along with that box. So box was J.D.'s. He claims the box. He claims he taped the box. He claims that his fingerprints should be on the box. J.D. originally admitted that the box was his. He admitted that he had packed it, he had sealed it, and that it was the box that he and Richard had moved to Richard's house. But J.D. also claimed that that box was filled with quilts and shoes, and he had no idea how Carolyn's body got inside. Now let's put up Richard Johnson. He's the guy who found her in the box. 
found at his house on his property. What's your name? Richard Johnson. What are you seeing in there, Richard? Looks like a human, curled up. I can see a bracelet. I can see his long reddish brown hair. Did he do anything that would set off alarm bells in a cop's head with the way he found the box and how he responded? Some of Carolyn's personal belongings were in his house. Things that look nice, like porcelain figurines and things like that, which are things women wouldn't normally walk away without taking. You know what I mean? Okay, so next... The smell? Yeah. He just assumed it was cats coming in and using the back porch for a litter box. Seriously, dude, that they smell, that come smell on. smell that he's been smelling doesn't make any sense. The foul smell of a body especially after three years of decomposition, would be overwhelming. Richard is a hoarder, which might have obscured the smell a bit, but I can't believe after three years he wouldn't at least investigate this. I'm just surprised those body fluids didn't come through the bottom of the container. It can eat through plastic? Oh, yeah. There's a big thing on Richard. Yes. He's a pervert. <laughs> Police discovered that Richard had numerous cameras installed around his house, including some hidden cameras in his bathroom. He's videotaping women going to the bathroom and naked in his house and saves the videotapes. It makes him a little weird and it makes him scary and we have to figure out what kind of scary he is. So next up on their board, that's not really a suspect, but is a big issue, is it an accident, right? Right. The issue came up with the DA's office saying... The old DA. The old DA. This, that it may have been an accident, that we couldn't prove murder, based upon that Carolyn was an alcoholic, which in turn would lead you to believe I got drunk, fell down, and hit my head. The former DA said that Carolyn's injuries may have been accidental, which threw a monkey wrench in the investigation. In order for us to move forward, we need an official determination of how Carolyn died. And if she fell and hit her head, obviously there's no intent on the part of any suspect to hurt her or to kill her. They could have just put her in that box because they were afraid to call the police. If Carolyn did die of an accidental head wound, then our suspect could have just packed her in the box because he panicked. That's bad, but that doesn't make it murder. I think we got our work cut out for us. The first thing we have to do is clear up whether Carolyn's death was an accident or a murder. If it was a murder, we're gonna need to get good DNA reference samples from our suspects, and we're gonna do our very best to find all the other little pieces and circumstantial evidence to make this case as strong as possible. We're going to meet Carolyn's daughter, Victoria. Carolyn had six children, but we're meeting the one who had been searching for her mom for years. This is the daughter that was put up for adoption as an infant. Hi, Victoria. Yolanda McClary. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Kelly. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. We're excited to talk to you. What led to you trying to find your mom? Probably about the time I was 15 or 16, I started searching for my biological mother. So I started making phone calls, found the names of my siblings. And they're like, we can't find her. We don't know where she's at. At that point, it was kind of a dead end. So what was the first thing, first information you ever found? I get an email from my stepsister. She says, this is important, it's about mom. I'm like, oh, cool. I run to the phone, I call her. I'm like, what's up? And um, she proceeded to tell me that mom's body was found here in Aurora. Up until this point, it was searching for a woman who I knew was my biological mother. Who you thought was alive and you wanted to meet. And who I wanted to meet. And then we talked to the coroner. I got to sign my name on a line that said daughter. And that was just beyond me. I think that we're all here ready to try our hardest to give you as many answers as we can. It's sad to think about how close Victoria got to finding her mother, but then what she finds out is that her mom died right before she met her. All that Victoria was looking for was a connection. The least we can do is try and get some answers for her. It's been a long time since I've walked into a coroner's office. Are you going to do your lawyer thing, like nail them down on what they think the cause of death is? He's a guy that basically makes the whole case work. And without his opinion as right. to cause of death, there's too many outs for a defense lawyer to have and reasons for a prosecutor to not want to take the case. 
The former district attorney disagreed with the medical opinion of the medical examiner. The medical examiner ruled the death a homicide. The DA said, well, it could have been an accident. And with that could have been an accident opinion, the case came to a standstill and nothing progressed from there. Ready, girl? What we need to do today is ask this medical examiner if he still has the same opinion and how he would testify in a courtroom today about Carolyn's death, an accident or a murder. Obviously, it's a difficult case to do because all we're left with is skeletal remains and there's no skin or internal organs to look at any correlation to the injuries that we see on the skeleton. We looked at virtually every bone. She had a fracture of her skull and was kind of on the left side on the forehead. It also looked like her nose was probably broken too. Some of the bones that are right there on the nasal bridge were broken as well. Since no weapon was found and Carolyn's injury didn't display any distinctive weapon marks, it's possible her injuries were caused by someone slamming her head into a wall or floor or by her being intoxicated and possibly falling. What about alcohol? We did didn't find any alcohol. Right. People that have been drinking and they fall, they typically fall backwards. That's basically where their center of gravity is. So when you're asked the, the final question on the witness stand, what is your expert opinion as to the cause of death, what would you say? My opinion would be that she died from blunt impact injuries to the head. And in view of everything else that we know about the case, it's a homicide. We now know that this is a homicide. We need to focus on figuring out who committed this murder. We just confirmed with the medical examiner that the mysterious death of Carolyn Jensen in 2002 was a homicide. We have two suspects in this case, J.D. Harrington, who is Carolyn's former roommate, and Richard Johnson, a mutual acquaintance of both of theirs, who claims that he found the body in a box in his backyard. This is similar to the box that our victim would have been placed in, put in fetal position, so to speak, into a tub about this size. He forced her in there. Anything, even an object or a tool that's used to help commit a murder can be called a murder weapon. In this case, we have this box. He would pick her up like this and set her like this and then smash, smash, shove. The question is, when did it become a weapon? Did that happen in JD's apartment? Or did it happen later at Richard's house? Duct tape was used to go around the edge, so it was actually formed going all the way around several rounds. This box has been tested before, but nothing as in-depth as what we're doing this time. Since it's JD's box, we know that his DNA is on the outside of it. And since Richard helped move the box, Richard's DNA should also be on the box and completely explainable. But to find out who sealed the box, we want to look at the sticky side of the tape. We know that Richard's DNA will be on the section of the tape he removed in order to see the body. So we're focused on the rest of the tape, hopefully discovering who sealed Carolyn inside. Of course, that's if there's any DNA to be found at all. It'll be cool, too, if the tape comes back with the DNA in the layers. It's like he's typing his own warrant because his prints are in the tape. Hi, guys. Hey, Sarge. I wanted to let you guys know that we got the results back from CBI. The DNA results could be key in this case. We've been waiting for preliminary test results to come in to see if any DNA profiles have been developed. Uh, there was DNA developed. We have profiles that were on the smooth portion of the tape. We have profiles that were developed from the underneath sticky side. And it does say mixture, and where it says mixture, it indicates that there's an unknown female, unknown males. Now that we have viable DNA on the tape, the next step is to compare the DNA profiles to samples taken from our suspects. We have a DNA, I think, of Richard. I don't think we have one of JD. Yeah, I reviewed the case. We don't have anything for Harrington, so we're going to have to get a, a direct comparison. If we talk to JD, he says, go pound sand, then we have to have something in place to say, oh, no, we're not leaving without. Can we get a court order? That's the best bet, to have it in hand, in pocket. Time is of the essence here. We need to get the DNA sample from JD Harrington because if he figures out that we've reopened the case, he could take off out of here and would never get it. Okay, so you need to type it up and you need to find a judge to sign it. Okay. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yo, it's your day. What you thinking? First, we're gonna go look at the apartment that JD and Carolyn were living in. 
We need to give the DA a lot more than just DNA results. We want to give him a solid foundation of circumstantial evidence. We need to keep pushing forward and uncover as much as we can. I feel like we're going to buy dope. Since no one really knows where Carolyn's murder took place, we have to consider the apartment she shared with JD is a definite possibility. Oh, okay. Would have just been one living room area. So it's a one bedroom? It'd be easy to get on each other's nerves, huh? Can you see tempers flying a little bit in here? JD claims the last time that he saw Carolyn was just before she stole his rent money and skipped town. One possible scenario for this murder is that JD killed Carolyn and placed her inside of a storage container. Since JD had no car and no way to dispose of the container, he would have to take her with him when he was evicted from their apartment. So what would he have done? Call his friend Richard and ask him to bring his van and help him move. So per Richard's statement, the boxes were already packed up and they actually passed them through this window. If you backed a car up to it, nobody even see what you're putting in there. But I don't know if there's any way to determine whether or not this would have been the place where it occurred. I mean, it has to be because he didn't have a car. I think you're okay saying the murder happened here. Yeah, you may not know what room, but... Or how, but I would say that's a safe guess. And it has to be here. Because he didn't have a car, it would make no sense that he would kill her somewhere else and then transport the body back to the apartment and place her in the box. But I'm not 100% convinced that JD is the killer. There's still more work to do. The only thing that keeps sticking in my mind is you're lifting this box that's weighing at least 100 pounds. According to Richard's initial statement, he didn't mention having any problems moving any of the boxes from JD and Carolyn's apartment. But he would think that Richard would remember removing something that heavy. Now that we've seen it, you see how high the window is to get to that level. So you know it would take two people to lift it up. Both of those guys had to have been straining. Was Carolyn actually in the box at the time? And therefore, is JD our killer? Okay, let's try to do JD today, do the buckle swap today, and we'll wait for CBI to do their thing. We're investigating the cold case homicide of Carolyn Jansen. And we've got DNA on the box that she was found in that could identify our killer. So today we're gonna to get a court order which will allow us to collect J.D. Harrington's DNA swab for comparison purposes. Hey, you never know what he'll say. When you're coming at him for a buckle, maybe he'll all of a sudden start sweating because this is the first time this has ever happened to him. DA called back. He would like to measure J.D.'s level of cooperation. If we went down and talked to him, would he give us, by consent, the swab? Would he even talk to us? And if he tells us to get out of here? Yell him out kind of thing. The DA doesn't want us to go the court order route at this point, so we're gonna go see J.D. Harrington, talk to him and see if he'll give his DNA to us consensually. All right, let's go. Looking for room number four. Is that in here? Yeah. Here, okay. J.D., what's up? How are you, sir? What can I do for you? We're still uh, looking into the death of Carol Jansen and wanted to know if we could buy a little of your time. Talk to you. And we also need a DNA sample. Well, why don't I just give you a call later? Can we get the DNA sample now? We'll do it right here, right in the hallway. How's that? I'm not comfortable doing any of this. No. As telling as it is that J.D. is being evasive, what's making us crazy is that we might have to leave here empty-handed. If you have 30 minutes to talk to us. I'll call you Monday morning. Keep trying, Alan. Good job. Well, can we at least get the DNA sample and then we can talk to you on Monday? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. All right. You don't have to get angry. Do you have a cell phone, sir? You look like you're getting aggravated. I don't want to aggravate you. Why can't I just call you Monday? Because you won't. You seem a little pissed that he wouldn't give it up. You see how pissed he got when I asked yeah. him for his phone number? <laughs> I heard what you were saying. So there's not el nothing else we can do with him right now except wait until Monday. But the thing is, he's not just not going to call. He he's gone Monday. He's leaving. I bet you he's going to be on the run. You think so? Yes. yes. At this point, we have to have a court order in order to get his DNA reference sample. And if we don't get that quickly, he might just leave town. In the meantime, we've managed to track down J.D.'s former boss, and she knew both J.D. and Richard around the time the murder happened. My hope is that she might have some detailed information or knowledge about what was going on back then that'll help us get somewhere in this case. Let's talk about J.D. 
But you saw him have outbursts on multiple occasions. So on the job site, he would get frustrated. He didn't have good decision-making skills. Something could flip him very easily into something bad. There you go. Just like, flipping a switch, he'd right. be, like, enraged and then... Right, gone. Mm. Did you see it escalating? My one interaction with J.D. in a bad situation was he had gotten drunk and was suicidal. J.D. was suicidal? Yes. Mm. It's possible that J.D.'s drug use and his anger could have pushed him over the edge, but what about Richard? And you met Richard. The impression I got was sort of like he picked J.D. up as kind of a, a wayward stray cat. Like that. I had heard this woman's name mentioned. Carolyn? Carolyn. You know, off and on since I'd known Richard, and I was hearing stories about Richard going to help J.D. get out of that apartment because Carolyn had left. My concern at the time was, I'm at, I'm at Richard's house, and they had her purse and her wallet. And whose purse and wallet? Carolyn's. Did you see that? Yes. That's new. At Richard's home? Right. I think it was a handbag with a strap. The wallet was a... God, I don't remember. It was a wallet. I mean, I kept asking, why would she take off and leave her purse? Good question. Mm -hmm. What was their answer? They didn't know. J.D. claims that Carolyn took his money and skipped town. But why would she leave her purse behind? And more importantly, why would she leave her wallet? When you were interviewed by the police before, none of this information came out. Is there any particular reason why in regards to the purse? And... I didn't You know, I just wanted to make sure people didn't wrap Richard into this somehow. But, I mean, I know he's not capable of killing anybody. The thing that's still baffling me is... If Richard is the killer, why would he leave a body in a box in his backyard all this time? If J.D. is the killer, why would he leave a body in a box that everyone knows belongs to him? Whoever the killer is, maybe they were afraid they would get caught trying to get rid of the box, or they just figured the other guy would take the blame. We're all pretty sure that there's only one person who knows if Richard is involved in this, so it's time for us to pay him a visit. So now we're headed to the house where Richard found the body in the box. He still lives there, so we're hoping that he'll be home. And depending on his health, um, they want to try and bring him down to the station. There they are. Here we go. In 2005, investigators searched every inch of this house for clues. And while they found evidence of Richard's hoarding and certain sexual interests, they found no evidence relating to Carolyn's murder. Today, we don't have a warrant, and Richard doesn't have to talk to us. Hi, Richard. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Connor of the Royal Police Department. Hi. Can I come in and talk to you real quick? Sure. OK. Hey, Richard, how are you, sir? Pretty good. We're doing, Richard, is, uh... Looking into a case from back in 2005. I don't know if you remember or not. Back on your back porch. Uh, how can I forget? Yeah, exactly. Well, what we'd like to do is go over uh, what occurred back then. Uh, preferably, we'd like to do that down at the office, if that's okay. We can give you a ride with us and bring you right back. Uh, I'll follow you. You can follow us. Let's go. Nice, 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 nice. Richard has agreed to come in. He's either playing innocent or he truly is. We are in Aurora, Colorado, investigating the 2002 cold case murder of Carolyn Jansen. We know that Richard Johnson helped move J.D. Harrington's belongings to Richard Johnson's house and to his patio for around the time of the murder. We need to talk to Richard so we can figure out once and for all if he is Carolyn's killer. Take us step by step just on that box. JD had all of his stuff in boxes, including this this big plastic tub. Mm -hmm. And it was all taped up. Between us, we picked it up, we hit it, opened up the the window, and we lifted it up and we got it out. This is new. He never said it took two of them to lift it up before. When you're picking it up in that basement apartment to put it out that window, what do you think it weighs? Over 100 pounds. Really? Did John tell you what was in there? Did you ask him what was in there? No. Okay. I remember J.D. would keep asking about his stuff on the patio, and I, 
I says, I have no reason to go through your stuff. You don't have to worry about me. It's not my stuff. Oh, that's new. We never knew before that he was checking on it periodically. Richard sounds really convincing, but he needs to have a really good explanation for why Carolyn's belongings ended up in his house soon after the murder. I saved those thinking that at some point she was going to stop by and I was going to have something I could sit there and say, you know, I felt so bad that I saved something for you. The only reason I opened that box is somehow something put a crack in the in the, in the lid. Mm -hmm. And it was the smell I kept smelling for the longest time. Right. And I kept accusing, thinking that my brother's cats were coming over on my patio. Right. When I first looked in the box, I saw comforters. And that's when I started peeling open the lid. Remember the first thing I saw was what appeared to be a foot. And the first thing that went through my mind my God is Carolyn. Richard's story today is consistent with what he told the police long ago. I looked down and I was able to see the comforter and I could see the bugs and I realized that's where the smell was coming from. How long have you been smelling? At least a year, on and off, depending on the weather. Okay. So I started opening it up. And the first thing I saw were the feet. Then I, I noticed that little bracelet that was on and it sunk in. And that's when I stood up and I yelled over at my brother, Bud, I think I've got a human body here. It's telling when you're consistent in your stories and it's an indication that you are being truthful and credible. If we want to go back and take a look around, is that okay with you? Sure. Anytime. Right. Because he's being so cooperative, we're going to jump on this opportunity to go out to his property and look at his backyard. So if we can go around back and walk through the whole thing. Fine. Just answer anything I can. Great. It was left out here on the patio. So show me, was it right over along this wall? Right where you're standing, right there is where the, the box was for all those years. Right here. And then were things stacked on top of it? Uh, until the day I decided to move it from here to the shed. Okay. When I get in the backyard at Richard's house, I immediately notice that nothing's changed. And look at the pictures from 2005. Most of the same junk are still there. The shed where he was moving the container to to put it in and lock it up is in the same spot. It's kind of like being at the crime scene on the day. It's just like taking a step back in time. It's clear to me now why Richard didn't investigate the smell on his patio earlier. For years, the box was sitting outdoors, tightly sealed, sitting amongst a variety of junk and easily accessible to his neighbor's pets. And after talking to him and checking out his story, I think that we need to come to a decision. Of course, she was found at his house because he moved the box there with our suspect, JD. He actually called the police. He called his brother's attention to the body. If he had put the body in the box, he's not gonna draw attention to himself. It wasn't like the box came open, his brother was standing there and he had to make up a story. He's calling people to him, to him. Richard may be a little eccentric, but his story today is consistent with what it's always been. He has always been cooperative, which is hugely important. And now that we've seen this house and how he lives, it's more plausible to believe that he didn't know where that odor was coming from. Well, I think you could just mark Richard off the board. Mm -hmm. Even though we still don't have our DNA results, we are all in agreement that Richard Johnson had nothing to do with this murder. Okay, so everybody's agreeing we're going to mark Richard Johnson off the suspect board. Everybody needs a friend like Richard. And now that Richard is cleared in all of our minds, we are left with only one suspect. Good morning. I went to see the judge. We've got the court order to attempt to get a buckle swab from JD. Okay. So the next thing will be if he is there, then will he answer the door? Mm -hmm. Let's go see JD. He's home. The DNA evidence is still at the lab, and now we have our court order that will allow us to go to JD Harrington's house and collect his reference sample from him. We already have a very good case against JD, but DNA evidence is always just icing on the cake. The only concern we have now, though, is that JD might have skipped town. That's it right there. Let's pull him back, see if he's even. Yeah. And here lies the problem. We get to JD's rooming house, and we can't get in. 
Here's a fire escape right here with a window open, but that might be his window. Yeah, but you can't get across to it. Excuse me, sir. We're the police department trying to get in the building. Can you let us in? Okay, thanks. I guess your middle name's not Grace, is it? <laughs> Appreciate it, man. It's a hard place to get in. Good morning, John. How are you? Well, I'm all right. Yay. Thank God. You mind if we come in? Feel free. But we'd like to get the DNA sample, and then we'll be out of your hair. They can't question him here as of the court order. They're prohibited from doing that now. This was an order from the judge, a court order, in case you didn't want to. Well, now that I understand what this is about. All I'm going to do is reach inside your mouth and swab it with these swabs, okay? I'm looking around the room, and he has a nice computer. And on the screen, he is looking up case law on uh, DNA. Well, I see you were educating yourself on DNA and case law. I was looking at something quite relative. I think he knows that he's got problems, and, and it's coming. If you would be willing to, what would be a convenient time for you to answer some additional questions that we have and try to clear things up? Um, I'm sure something can be arranged. Appreciate it, man. John, thank thanks. you. He thinks he's smart. I know. It's the only reason why he thinks he's coming is because he thinks he can beat you. Yep. Just an evidence envelope. Right. And off they go. J.D.'s DNA sample is bag tagged and on its way to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation's lab. Now we just have to wait for the results. The chief came by. Wanted well, to know where you were. We told him that you were. Oh, he's here? Yeah. JD's here. Awesome. Go get him. Honestly, I can't believe JD is here which tells us that either he thinks he can outsmart all of this, or maybe he thinks he's already going in custody. We should be done with you by then. We'll go down this way. J.D., if you want to have a seat right over there. You know, I know the police interviewed you many, many years ago, so what we're doing is going back over some of the same stuff, but a few other questions. So I don't Do want to answer anything. You're not under arrest. Yeah. You came here willingly. And yeah. You I want came to leave. willingly last time, too. You don't have to be here. Have a good day, gentlemen. How do I get out? Well, you can't just walk out into the police department. You don't want to answer just a few questions? You know, if I was looking into a case like this, I'd be looking for somebody that had a serious problem with women, somebody with a police reports alleging cameras being placed in bathrooms, somebody with probably gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of pictures and so you're pointing toward mm -hmm. Richard right you're not pointing towards anybody unlike Richard JD is very fast today to point the finger at somebody besides himself he wouldn't even look at them I know he's got a ball cap on pulled down yep do you and Carolyn ever get into an argument about anything not till she disappeared no did you argue with her then about I didn't see her I would have argued with her if I could have did you ever consider yourself in a relationship with her at all I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> yeah. When you move to Richard's, do you pack everything or do you have your, anybody come over and help you pack stuff? Richard, you know, offered to store stuff for me. Right. Offered to store but didn't offer to pack. And then Richard came over and helped you move it? Mm -hmm. That's good. And so the container that we're talking about... I don't know. I can't even guarantee you it was mine. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn had containers. And Can't Richard had containers. When he was interviewed before, he said, it is my box and I'm the one that taped it. Today, not so much. So he's distancing himself, trying to make himself look innocent. Did you put the duct tape on the containers? I put tape on a lot of stuff, yeah. Okay. Was there any containers heavy enough that both you and Richard had to lift together? I'm sure we moved things together, yeah. What kind of things of Carolyn's did you bring to Richard's? Some of her nicer clothing and accessories and shoes. What about her purse and wallet and ID and stuff? I don't recall. So how do you think Carolyn ended up in that container? Appreciate you coming in.
Our main suspect in Carolyn Jansen's murder, J.D. Harrington, just left the interview room. How'd y'all like it when we started out blaming Richard? I thought it was great. That was beautiful. It sure looks to us like we have a great circumstantial evidence case against J.D. Harrington for the murder of Carolyn Jansen. His explanation is ridiculous and the circumstances are crazy and y'all did a good job with the interview. I think that we're fine and you made it even better. You take into account the fact that J.D. owned the box. J.D. had all the stuff, including this big plastic tub. And he alone is the one that packed it and taped it. You got him to say, Richard offered to store it, but not to pack it. And you add into that what we've learned about his temper. The impression I got was he would get frustrated if something could flip him very easily. He tensed up. I mean, he got really angry because of the money issue. Did you argue with her then? I would have argued with her if I could have. And his evasiveness and body language even today. Can we get the DNA sample now? I'm not comfortable doing any of this. Did you ever consider yourself in a relationship with her at all? He's got that ball cap down and he's talking like this and y'all are over here. The minute I start to digging at Carolyn with him, he would look at me and then look away. I can't recall. I don't remember. So looking at all these factors we have up here against JD, how do y'all feel about the strength of our case right now? Yolanda? It's a great case. Alan? Yeah, I think it's a good case. It's your case, Steve. What do you I, think? I agree. I'm ready to go. With the DNA, it's going to be the icing on your cake. At this point, we've accomplished much of what we set out to do. This is a very strong circumstantial evidence case. While the DNA results would be icing on the cake, we just haven't gotten them back from the lab. So we're just going to have to wait. While we have a good case, we can't bring this to the DA without knowing those results. But we're going to continue to track this case once the DNA results come back. Well, we've been very, very busy. Steve Connor has been awesome to work with. And it's very, very good news and very encouraging. It hadn't happened yet because they're waiting on some DNA results to come back. So we can't give you like the final answer, but uh, it looks really good. We're very excited about the case, let's just put it that way. Is the DNA going to be the dis deciding factor? In our opinion, this case is just fine even without DNA, mm -hmm. but you always want to check everything, just like you would. Right. So they need to see what that answer is before they can do the next step, but the case is good either way, okay? I don't know. Can I ask, is it who I think it is? Is it kind of the yes. obvious? Yes. <laughs> yes. Come on, really? Yes, it is. Of course it is. And not only do I think he should be tried for murder, I think he should be tried for theft. And the reason I think he should be tried for theft is because if I had found my mother, every likelihood that she would have told me who my biological father is. So not only did he take the chance for me to meet her, but he took that piece of knowledge from me too. The DNA came back. The results are consistent with what we hoped for. Real quick, I'm just going to search one more time to make sure I didn't miss anything. J.D. Harrington's DNA was found on the sticky side of the duct tape. Release your hands. The DA was excited about those results and all the other circumstances and made the decision to arrest J.D. Harrington for the murder of Carolyn Jansen. We've reviewed some of the um, physical evidence as it relates to you and the uh, container that Carolyn was found in. Steve will try to interview him again, this time confronting him for the first time with DNA evidence coming back to implicate him in Carolyn's murder. Judge issue a warrant for your arrest. You know what's going to happen next. We'll see if he finally admits what he did or lies again. You want to talk about what's going on? No, sir. So you don't want to say anything? No, sir. No, sir, what? I do not choose to speak with you. Okay. Okay, bring it back for me. 